visiting a church in New York when I was still living there, and um, uh, after service, we have a potluck, so we have um, a lunch together. And in the table that I sat uh, uh, was an um, uh, Indian young man, and he sat on the other side of the table, and we have a quick conversation during lunch, but I have another appointment in the afternoon, so we, we couldn't talk for too long. And he was visiting, first time attending Adventist Church. And, and I noticed that he wanted um, uh, to continue the conversation. So I gave him my card and said, text me and during the week, we're going to meet somewhere. And said, oh, we can meet and, and have um, dinner together, uh, eat tea, right? Uh, and, uh, and then I told him, okay, great, so we're going to meet and go to an Indian restaurant. I said, right. So he sent me a text during the week. We met in Manhattan. This is... Um, um, Broadway, Bloomingdale's, well, a large um, um, uh, store in Manhattan, and I made the appointment, I think it was 5 o'clock, and uh, I met him there. I was by myself, my wife wasn't with me. If she was with me, we're going to get late to the appointment because she would get lost on, on this tour. Uh, and we walked a couple of blocks and we went to an um, Indian restaurant, not too big, as everything in New York looks like old and small, but we walk into that restaurant and uh, maybe have a half, a half a dozen of people there. Uh, but the only, uh, my, my friend and the waiter, they were the only uh, Indians in the restaurant. All the others, I mean, looked like me or maybe they were Americans or Europeans, I don't know. So I was thinking about that and he, and he asked me, what do you want? And I said, well, anything, but has to be vegetarian and not spicy. Because for Indians, you tell them, no spicy, and it's a spice enough, okay? Uh, because um, you know what I'm saying, right? Is that right, Ronald? Oh, you don't think so, but uh, uh, it can be very spicy. When they say spicy, most of us won't be able to, to eat it. So I had a, I had a good um, meal with my friend, but I, I kept thinking about that. You know, if I, when we go to church, especially an, an Adventist church, what do you see there? Most of the time, everybody... I mean, you may have people from different nationalities, but we know that most of people attending there, they are Adventists, right? So we have our church like a place for, uh, a meeting place for Adventists. Is that the reality? And I think, what if our church was more like that Indian restaurant? That you have more people that are not Indians than those who are there. What if our church becomes a place where you have people walking from the streets and, feel, and entering, attending service, and feel comfortable? And even understanding what we are doing or enjoying the worship, the singing, the praying, and everything else. So think about that when you go home and every time you sit down with the leaders, the pastors, and the, and the elders to plan for worship or a special uh, you know, uh, spiritual revival, make sure you design something that will make sense for those who don't belong. They are just newcomers. I think this is extremely important. But uh, I saw the sign, some of you probably saw it, a church that is waiting for sinners to visit their building is like the police waiting for the criminals to visit their station. Can you imagine that? A policeman by the door, the police station saying, oh, come on in. You're a criminal. Yeah, come on in and feel comfortable. Uh, that's never going to happen, right? Nowhere. So in the church, the same thing. We exist. I like the way Wayne Krause says, we are here for, uh, we exist for those who are not here yet. That's what he used to say in his church there. When I visit, I heard him saying that um, uh, many times. So that's really this, that should describe the reason we exist as a church. We are here for those who are not here yet. So there is a purpose in our existence. And that purpose has to do with a call that God gave to us. Ellen White describes the first step on church organization. So let's read it. And if you have your Bible, you can follow me uh, reading Mark chapter 3. Verse 14, intentionally I didn't put on the screen, so you can open uh, your Bible, your device, and look into um, your Bible. What is written in Mark chapter 3, verse 14. As I said, Ellen White mentions that this is the first step on the process of uh, the, the church organization. And what was that? Well, Mark 3, 14 says, He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. 
very objective. Jesus um, uh, had a strategy. Uh, and it says, when you compare to Luke, he mentioned that Jesus spent the whole night in prayer on the top of the mountain. Uh, Mark doesn't give all the details because Mark is very objective. See, Mark is the shortest uh, gospel, but at the same time is the one that presents the most uh, content compared to the others. Uh, because he's very objective. And then, and then, and the following day, and the next day, and then, and then, he goes like this. Boom, boom, all the time. So in other Gospels, you compare and see some details. And uh, like I said, uh, Luke mentioned that Jesus spent the whole night because he had a very important decision to make the next day. And the decision was to select a few that will be uh, working closer to him. Jesus had many disciples. At that time, I believe, uh, there is hundreds or maybe a couple of thousands that used to attend some of his um, meetings. But he said, you know what? I need to focus my ministry. And I'm, I dream about a church that can develop a system where every leader will have a trainee. Every elder will be trained a young person, a teenager, to become in the future you know, their replacement. Because if you, are in the, as an, if you are working as an elder for more than 30 years, and at the end of the year, or two years, whatever you do in the, your nominating committee, and there is nobody else to be an elder, I mean, something is wrong with your leadership because you are not preparing leaders. I believe the, most, the best way to measure the effectiveness of a leader is how he developed new leaders. Jesus did this. When you look to Jesus' ministry, people might say, well, he hadn't done much. He made some, some miracles here and there, resurrect a couple of people, but uh, that's not much. But he told his disciples, you know, way more things you will see. So when the disciples were empowered by the Spirit and started their ministry, they did way more than Jesus himself could have done. Uh, it is says that Jesus select the twelve. And actually, there are some controversy, understand, the 12, the number, because you know that some, uh, at least one of them were not direct uh, picked by Jesus. And this happens all the time, you know, among the disciples, they have some politics. And even though Jesus didn't want to pick Judas, I mean, the, the others keep looking, and this is the best person we have, the most qualified. Look at his resume. He's, uh, he's the best candidate. How come Jesus didn't pick him first place? And uh, Ellen White made a comment on the book, The Sire of Ages, and she explained how this happened. She says, Jesus didn't pick him from the beginning, but uh, with the influence of the other disciples, he accepted him as part of the select group. So in a sense, he was not chosen. In another sense, yes, Jesus appointed him also. So that's the way we can understand reading The Desire of Ages. But anyway, at the end, we know that the story didn't finish uh, very well for, for him. Uh, the prophecy was fulfilled, uh, too bad for him, but um, Jesus um, fulfilled his mission. Uh, but the meaning of the word apostles, so when we see the apostles, the meaning of the word is the one who is sent. Uh, God's nature is at the root of mission. The living God portrayed in the Bible is ascending God. He sends because of his love for the world. So the main reason for us to serve or to be engaged in mission is love. And people will notice if, uh, if we are genuine, if we have really intentions to help and to show God's love to them, or we are just trying to show a good report and results at the end of the, the year. So um, Jesus called the apostles, and this is, um, as I said, was the first uh, step in the organization of the church. So now we go to the most, um, most interesting part of this um, uh, this presentation. I put the name of this, uh, his name is Bla uh, Blake Jones. He's a pastor in, um, in the States. And he did, um, uh, I read a couple of places about this, but I think he did a very nice summary of the, um, the, the call for pastors, elders, and, uh, or overseers. And uh, I know the text or the slides are not gonna show very nice because it has a lot of content. I really uh, don't like presenting slides like this but I couldn't find a better way. So I prepare, okay? Uh, this is not gonna be too fun to see you know, nice pictures on the screen, but the content extremely important for us to spend some time and consider 
uh, what he says. The original 12 were appointed direct by Jesus, and we saw this in Mark, and I also told you about Luke 6, 6 and Acts 1. Others were appointed by the church after his ascension, and we see the replacement of the 12, and as the church grew, uh, some kind of administrative uh, crisis came on and how to serve the tables and how to take care of a newcomers to the church. And I believe you, are, you face this on a regular basis because Melbourne is a city that is growing a lot. So you have new people, newcomers, immigrants coming all the time. Same thing happened in the early church. So because of that, what they did, they had to assign other leaders, deacons, to take care of the organization or the service, the, the management uh, crisis that they were facing because of the influx of newcomers. And this is a good problem, isn't it? Yes or no? It looks like you're not following me or you're not sure. When you have new people coming to church, it's a good problem, isn't it? And that's the time we need to help them when they arrive. See, on the top of the list, when people are more open to the gospel, are things like uh, divorced or becoming a widow, or the born of a new baby, or moving to a, a lost, a death in the family, or moving to a distant place. That's the immigrants. I even knew a church in uh, New England. They have um, the ministry of the airport. Uh, that's a community from Africa, and a little country in Africa. They hear about a new family coming, to, to America, they organize a small group, go to the airport and wait a family there. And then they offer the church service. Do you have a place to stay? Do you have family in town? Do you need a job? Can we help uh, uh, you to get a job and find an apartment to rent and things like that? So that's the time we need to help them when they need help, right? Because after an immigrant is living here in Australia for a couple of years, went to school, already graduated, got a good job, do you think it would be easy to reach them with the gospel? Forget it. They, they won't be listening to you. Unless if they are already Adventists. They're just moving into town. So we need to take, in a sense, advantage of the opportunity. Even though some of us might see it as a problem, it is an opportunity. And that's the difference between the optimist and the pessimist, right? It is um, an opportunity and a very uh, difficulty. That's the, the optimist. So um, the Bible says that the church was organized through the deacon, to the deacons to serve the church and help with the newcomers that were arriving. In Acts 11 and 14, we see the establishment of the office of elder. So then we go. Let's compare those, um, uh, those things. Um, okay. Three... Uh, Three different uh, words or designations, but actually they were developing the same office. Uh, the words, the original word episcopus, or translate as overseer or bishop in other um, translations. Poimen, this is the shepherd and the pastor, and presbyterus, which is the, the elder. So the New Testament, um, when we study these words, we find out that the use of these terms demonstrates that they are not they are not separate offices, but three designations of the same office. Let me show you a couple of um, Bible texts that uh, confirms this. So Paul uh, wrote to Titus 1, 5 to 7. He says, for this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint, what? Elders, original word, presbyters. In every city, as I directed you, namely, if any man is above, and then he describes characters, qualities of this, uh, this person. If any man is above reproach, husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for to be what? For the overseer, that's another word, episcopus, must be above reproach of God's steward. In this text, we see two words linked together to describe the same office or the same function uh, in the church. Are you with me? You, you following that? So we're already talking about uh, here the presbyterus and the episcopus, okay? Overseer, uh, overseer and an elder, 
All right. So let's see another another uh, text in Acts 20 when it links with the shepherd or the pastor. When Paul was passing through Ephesus, he called the elders. Now it's the word presbyters of the church to come to him. He then admonished them to be on guard for yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, that's the other word, to shepherd, that's pastors, the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So here we see that the elders, presbyters, the overseers, episcopus, and, um, and the pastors, shepherds of the Ephesian church, they, their task was practically the same. The way they are, the words are used, um, um, different words, but describing the same, uh, the same office. A similar, a similar, uh, they are used interchangeably, uh, uh, similar to that on these um, three terms. They appear in First Peter chapter five, also. So what happened? So we see in the Bible those three words or office are practically the same. What about the uh, Adventist Church? Early Seventh-day Adventists saw these New Testament office as different designations of the same office. John Loughborough, one of our pioneers, he wrote in 1907, the term pastor is from poimen. It signifies the same office as presbyters, elder, and episcopus, bishop, a local office confined to a particular uh, church. So it is, it is important to note um, uh, that nowhere in the New Testament we find the modern practice of sending a hired, full-time, paid, outside pastor to take care of a local church. It has no base in the Bible or in the beginning of the Adventist movement. Um, is there a right there and so far? Okay, you're following me? Yeah, so if there is anything you don't agree, you have time to fix the next couple of years. So uh, you work with them later. But today, since you invite me, <laughs> uh, we, also, well, we also didn't find the modern practice of having, uh, you know, just one person in charge of a church. Because every time it speaks about the elders, it says in the plural. That's another thing. So it's a teamwork. And uh, I was challenged by one, uh, uh, someone that is not um, part of our organization anymore, and he said, Adventist Church doesn't have any prevailing church, because a prevailing church must have a team, a pastoral team. Okay, we don't, very few churches, very few Adventist Church has uh, a pastoral staff, paid staff. But most of our churches, and I challenge you here, we may have one or two exceptions. Most of our church, we have a team of elders. This is biblical, okay? This is the example of the Bible. So we're not supposed to have just one person running the show the whole time. I mentioned to some of you, I went to, uh, we had a, a big problem in one of our churches in New York, and uh, we have two couples. Uh, they are both elders. I mean, the, the, the female not the female, the male, the two elders, male elders, and their spouses holding more than 20 offices in a church of 300 members. I mean, if you have a small group and you do several things, that's understandable. But you have more than 300 people attending regularly the church, and you have two couples holding more than 20 offices or ministries. The extreme control brought up an environment that was sick. Okay, the church stopped growing. They had very a lot of divisions and conflicts, and I I shouldn't tell you more than this because this has been recording. But even the legal problems and criminal activities took place. It was extremely sad, and I know them both, and I believe they have a good heart and good intentions. But good intentions are not going to take anybody to heaven. Okay, so we have we need to have a little bit more than that. So the Bible is is clear. It's a teamwork. We cannot have one person in charge year after year for decades if they are not, if that person is not developing a team and training the new generation to be uh, equipped and empowered. And I know 
as a young person takes responsibility, he or she may make mistakes. But this is all right. We all do mistakes. We make mistakes all the time. But we need to trust as we, you empower. You train and empower. Let them make mistakes. It's better for them to make mistakes than leave the church because they don't feel that they have responsibilities. You want to say something? Uh, let me use the principle that um, uh, Anthony mentioned, that Jesus uh, answered questions asking other questions, right? So what do you think about um, a pastor that is single? The Bible says he should have one wife, and I believe the principle is that the, he shouldn't have more than one. But it doesn't mean that if she doesn't have, he or, the, or she doesn't have any, it couldn't be uh, an elder. So I believe the principle is... Um, purity and monogamy. That's the principle behind. So I wouldn't have a problem, in other words. I don't think so. Same thing with kids. Said they should rule their family well. What about pastors that don't have any children? Yeah. Uh, what about? If they don't have kids. But if they have kids and the kids have problems, then it raises a red flag. I'm not saying that if you have some problems with your children, they left the church or they have... You know, um, they don't have a good reputation. You cannot be a, be a leader anymore. But I have personal experience, and I see a lot of times there are some controlling uh, spirit or lack of spirituality at home that brings this to happen. I'm not saying that this is the reason that young people leave the church all the time. And we may have some leaders here, good leaders, that unfortunately their kids are not uh, in the church anymore. But... Um, it raises a red flag, so we need to be careful. Uh, in another part it says they need to have good reputation from the outsiders. And Anthony did something very unique. Anthony, would you share with us? Because you told me as part of your um, um, questionnaire or interview for the elders and church planters, you, you, usually you do a, a question that is not common among us. It's in the Bible, but we don't practice. Okay, you know what I'm referring to? Yeah. So really simply, it, uh, one of the qualifications for elders is that they have a good reputation with outsiders. And so in the New Testament, outsiders are non-believers. In our churches, you often become an elder because you have a good reputation with insiders. And that's important because if you can't engage and work with relationally with the people in the church, you're not going to have leadership. So the Bible says... You have a good reputation in the eyes of outsiders. So one thing I do, we have a questionnaire that we use, but just in my practice, those that become elders in the churches where I serve or plant, I ask them, can you give me, before we go and take a vote and do all that stuff, can you give me the contact information for at least two people that are not Christians that you're close to? And you can stack the deck, right? But that could be through affinity which means you have a common hobbies. It could be through your vocation, you work together, or it could be through geography. You live in the same street. So then I contact those people and uh, let them know, hey, I'm friends with Joe, and he's being considered for a leadership position in a Christian church, and it's really important to us how we engage with those around us. So I just want to know what's it like to have Joe as a friend. Or I actually... And uh, I'm not just saying this, I really do it. But I walk down the street of those who are being considered to be elders and knock on the doors of their neighbors. Not to ask a religious question, but just to ask them, what's it like to have Joe as a neighbor? And they're like, I don't know, I've never seen him. You know, <laughs> he never comes out of his house. <laughs> Loud noises coming out of there. But you get a sense of how they live. Because as elders, you don't become an elder because you're a superhero spiritual leader, Right? You become an elder, you should become an elder because you set the example of what it looks like to be a member. And that's the role, is to come alongside others and to model what it looks like to live deep with God and others and to encourage them in that. That's the basics of it. So that would be one of the traits, um, one of several, that you can have practical action steps. Now, you can't do that if you haven't gone through the process yourself. So I have others that do that with me and check in on it. But that would be, I, I think, just understanding that and practicing that 
would create a dynamic where we, we have elders because of their spirituality and character, not because they can strategize and execute and organize. And sometimes in context where you have those in the corporate world or affluent business area, that can become the default. Oh, yeah, that's... Um, um, it's either Timothy or Titus. I have to pull it out. But it's there. It says, they should be ho- it says that elders should be hospitable, and hospitality means strangers, foreigners, and immigrants. And it also says they should have a good reputation with outsiders. So if you read uh, Timothy and um, Titus, there's also 1 Peter chapter 5. But I'm pretty sure that one's either Timothy or Titus. I'm sorry I don't have it right now. But that's an exercise you can do with your elders is you can just read through those three basic passages, Timothy, Titus, and Peter. And you can write down all the traits and you can ask the question, how many of these should all Christians demonstrate, all church members? And the reality is all of them except for two. And those two are the oversight of the church and the teaching of the gospel. And that's why there are some Christian uh, groups that will have a teaching elder and a ruling elder. Because administration and the the public proclamation of the gospel. But everything else is the same for everyone. So it says, you know, don't be drunk, be gentle, um, care for your family well. Like, we expect that from everyone who's a Christian. So again, it's just setting the example of what it looks like to be a member. It's not having a two-tiered system of spiritual professionals and spiritual amateurs. Very good. Does it help? That's awesome. I mean, I wish I have my boss or whoever takes the vote. Uh, when I started ministry, I was selected as an elder when I was young, uh, visiting you know, my neighbor and asking that question. I would love to. Uh, unless if you're afraid of something or if you don't have any name, you don't know anybody that you can give to Anthony to go and visit them. Because this is a, a beautiful testimony. You've been considered for a spiritual leadership in your congregation and you have your supervisor uh, come and visit your colleague or uh, in the work place or uh, your neighbor and ask that question. Would you support? I mean, just that is a beautiful testimony. Two years ago, I did this process with a, uh, someone in my church, a young guy who's a leader in the business world. We went through it. And he said, you know, I'm really not ready for this. And my response wasn't like, well, you can't be an elder. My response was affirmation. I said, the fact that you're honest and have integrity, God is blessing that. So let's check back. When would it be okay to check back with you? And there were some things in his life that he needed to get back on track spiritually. We all go through seasons. And so I checked back within a year, and things were totally different. And now he's like one of my best leaders. He oversees a lot of stuff in the church. So it's not to say you can or you can't. It's just to help people with the self-awareness of how we either are or are not quite living up to the calling that's been outlined by the apostles in the New Testament. Awesome. Yeah, beautiful, isn't it? Uh, very good. So let's let's move on. Uh, I think the, the, the point was uh, well made. Um, a few other testimonies. Well, we, we read this already about Loughborough. Uh, the next one is um, some early uh, Adventist ministers credited the church's rapid growth to this ministry model. What is the model? The model is the, the pastor is not paid. Okay? Some evangelists, ministers if we can use that word just to define those who are higher by the organization, they had their um, you know, position or role, but it's not being uh, in an established church. They were overseers for a region. They were itinerant evangelists and primarily church planters. Okay, so what happened? In 1886, Elder Starr was interviewed by a newspaper and asked about the rapid growth of Seventh-day Adventists. His reply was, well, in the first place, we have no settled pastors. See, during time and age when the Adventist church was growing fast, one of the first things that was identified about our organization, we have no settled pastors. Our churches are taught largely to take care of themselves, while nearly all of our ministers work as evangelists in new fields. Because 
See, this is, uh, we change this. We start doing evangelism inside the church. It doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, it's like fishing in the uh, fishbowl. It doesn't make sense. You have to go where people are, not inside the church. So in the beginning of our movement, the evangelists were going to new places. And like uh, Ramon, you're telling me, you know, you're entering a new area, help to build the church, do you know, programs for the children, and you go and preach for a week or two and establish a church. This is evangelism. Evangelism needs to be, as an activity, has to be linked to church planting. I, I don't, well, anyway, let's not go that way, it'll take too long. But um, the idea here is that uh, was identified in the beginning of the Adventist Church, the rapid growth of our denomination linked to the fact that we were not like other denominations that have a settled pastor. We, are, we, had a, we follow a biblical New Testament model. As the ministers would establish churches, they would ordain an elder and deacon who were to serve the church's pastoral and administrative needs. This model allowed the minister to continue sharing the gospel in new territories and raising up new churches. Some early uh, Adventist ministers credit the church's rapid growth to this ministry model, as we saw in the testimony of Elder Starr. Speaking to a ministerial um, institute in 1912, the General Conference President, Pastor Daniels, he stated, we have not settled our ministers over churches as pastors to any large extent. In some of the very large churches, we have elected pastors, but as a rule, we have held ourselves ready for field service, evangelistic work, and our brethren and sisters have held themselves ready to maintain their church service and carry forward their church work without settled pastors. I know because of the context that we live today, I believe that we could have some cases that in a large congregation, you have a pastor that preaches there on a regular base. But that church has a purpose, not just an end in itself, but becoming a center, a training center, an evangelistic center, and also an equipping center to send missionaries to the other parts of the territory. So it's not just a place where you have a good preacher preaching every weekend to attract more people there. No, there is a purpose. You attract, you know, you try, you reach a different kind of people, but you also empower and equip new leaders to go out and plant more churches. So in that sense, you can have a large congregation with one pastor there on preaching, speaking on a regular basis, but the purpose is to equip and train leaders to go out and reach out others. And we've seen places that work like that. I visit um, with um, a female pastor in China, and she has probably the large, you probably heard this in the news sometime, she is pastoring the largest congregation, I think it's close to 20,000, 15 or 20,000 people, uh, and not just one congregation. One congregation has a couple thousand people, but the, uh, she is the senior pastor of about 200 congregations. It's, it's actually a large conference that she runs. And uh, she stays most of the time in one place, but they are continuing training and equipping new leaders to go out and plant more churches. So I, I see this is kind of um, you know, similar to the original purpose. Uh, even though you have a, a lead pastor staying more in one place. But the purpose is still mission and expansion of the kingdom. See, it's not an end in itself. Um, well, let's, let's move on. Um, and I hope, he continues saying, um, Pastor Daniel said, uh, I hope that this will never uh, cease to be the order of affairs in this denomination. Again, I, he was saying, I hope in the future we won't have settled pastors. For when, for when we cease our forward movement work and begin to settle over our churches, to stay by them and do their thinking and their praying and their work that is to be done, then our churches will begin to weaken and to lose their life and spirit and become paralyzed and fossilized and our work will be on a retreat. And this is exactly what happened. The change that took place in 1920s, just a few years later, 
like a decade later of this statement made by the General Conference President, we start to increase, especially in North America, increase the number or decrease the number of churches per pastor. Okay, so we had more churches per pastor. In 1889, Ellen White um, uh, stated, we cannot expect that ministers will be permanently located in settled churches as they are located in other denominations. See, we copy the, the change that took place when Constantine, and I mentioned this on Friday night, it was not, not just a day of worship, the idea of having a building for worship, the idea of having priests celebrating religious uh, you know, service, that idea was, uh, came to the Christian faith, and after uh, hundreds of years, the, pro uh, the, the Protestants or the, um, uh, the, movement, the Reform Movement didn't change much of this, and they continue to have established uh, clergy over their congregations. So Ellen White says, uh, we cannot expect ministers will be permanently located in settled churches as they are located in other denominations. But each church member must individually learn to bear responsibility and become a worker, making the advance of the cause of truth the first and the highest interest of his life. We should not compare ourselves to other Christian denominations. That's the bottom line. So you plant a new church, and some of you are part of a new congregation, two, three years old. Some of you are meeting in a more uh, like an ethnic church. And I know I work with ethnic churches in North America for almost two decades. And I know how it is. You know, a few people coming from another country, they they have like 20, 30 people. They organize a new group, a new congregation. After a couple of years, they are sending enough money and they make the calculations. At the end of the year, we send 50,000, 100,000. Now we deserve to have a paid pastor. And know what happens? The church starts, the growth rate declines and becomes stagnant. I've seen this over and over again. The first couple of years, when lay leaders are in charge, the congregation is growing. It's moving fast. At the moment a new a pastor is assigned, starting conflicts, they start discussing a lot of things on the board that are not related to mission, and the church starts stagnating. Well, we, now, we have a visitor attained, we need to go Bible study. Oh, now we have a pastor. Uh, give to him. So the pastor starts having to deal with Bible study, you know, sermons, evangelistic revival things, you know, uh, prayer vision, and everything else. So and all the others become what? Just spectators, like we do when we go to watch a cricket game, right? Uh, so that's the reality that happens, and it happens all the time. Um, let's, let's move forward. 1901, Ellen White um, support in this New Testament leadership model. She said, God holds these uh, ministers responsible for the souls of those who are in darkness. He does not call you to go into fields that need no physician. Establish your churches with the understanding that they need not expect the minister to wait upon them and to be continually feeding them. And this is why I love the model that Anthony was describing yesterday. Planting new churches, organizing a leadership, lay leadership, and the pastor, the paid pastor, equip, trains, and go to raise another church. And how many churches a pastor can do like that? I mean, the model that we have, you, a pastor can have two or three, the most. But if we use the New Testament model, we can have a paid pastor overseeing five, 10, 15, 20. I saw, I have a friend, he had 32 congregations. What do you do? You just organize your visits. Once a month you're going to pass. So everything you have to do that, that needs the presence of the pastor, like a, a wedding ceremony, a funeral. No, you can't uh, organize and plan a funeral in advance like that. But, um, well, the elder can do the funeral. Let's leave this for the, for the elder, right? Uh, but actually, basically, what is just the weddings? What else? You need the... Or, and ordaining new elders, right? You need a pastor for that too. What else, uh, Darren, help me out here. Communion, the elders can do that, don't they? But usually, they, you know, the pastor can organize. This is something that they, on a quarterly basis, he can pass by and do communion. But the elders can do that also. Babe dedication, the elders can do that, right? 
Baptism? Well, we can plan baptism. In some places, you with the conference authorization, the elders also can do that. But it's easier to plan in advance and have like once a month or once a quarter, have a baptismal ceremony and the pastor will pass by. So it's not a big deal either, right? Let's say something. Um, yeah. I just, just want to say real quick that in early Adventism, the elders were in the churches, but the churches were much simpler in terms of the gathering and how it functioned. Mm -hmm. So if I'm listening to this today as a teacher, or not a vocational pastor, I'm thinking to myself, I'm busy. How in the world could I perpetuate the church where I'm at and all the programs? They didn't have all those programs. And so if we're going to recover this model, and there's strong biblical basis for it, we have to rethink yeah. how, the, how we do church, so to speak. So the future of American Christianity, at least where we're at you know, in the States, is churches that are more low-tech in real, authentic conversation. People aren't looking for the huge programs. So there's still a place for program-driven churches, but we didn't have that starting out. You can't be a full-time elder and coordinate Pathfinders, Adventurers, Sabbath School program, outreach, community service. Health. I mean, you've got to really look at it and say, what are the few things we want to do and do them well? And then it can be realistic for you to facilitate that. So we can't impose um, how we do church now on the reality back then. There were less competing interests. People weren't on the, the Internet all the time, but we really have to think about how church functions and how you do church. Okay. That makes sense? So let's try to be simple, doing less things but doing well. And if, you have, if we have more congregations in a geographic area, you may have churches that are strong in Pathfinder, the other one in health ministries. And we can collaborate and even have you know, uh, teams from the other church coming and supporting us. Yes. Brother Anthony's comment, bro. You'd have to reprogram society. We need, to, yeah, we need to start somewhere, right? Uh, and there is no, and as long as you use, um, you know, the Bible, the New Testament model, uh, it will be easier for us not to make many mistakes. At least we need to try to do something that will bring us closer to the original plan and what is church all about. Um, I can give you some um, examples. Uh, the first one that comes to my mind is James, James Lopez. I don't think you met him. He planted a church in the outskirts of New York. And I visited him once. They, have, they start a church with two small groups, two couples, holding two small groups on a weekly basis. They have, um, after two months, they start having worship. I visit them after one year. He's a businessman. And his wife is a school principal, public school uh, principal. And I attend the service. They have like 50 people attending, uh, plus children. And they baptize in one year eight people. So that's more than 100% of the membership growth by baptism. And I spent the Sabbath with them. And James was sitting on the back on the chair the whole time. He didn't say a word. And the church was well organized and smooth. You know, everything was perfect. And he didn't say a word. So how hard it is to do this? Well, we need to work in advance and create a team and empower people. So I see children participating, young people leading out. So it is possible. You don't have a problem with speaking appointment because anybody in the church can speak and share their testimony. Do you have to have a sermon every Sabbath? Is that part of the their sermon is actually a Bible study, an inductive Bible study. And uh, they are used to people raise their hand and telling a testimony in the middle of the sermon. So how hard it is to lead a worship like that. I mean, it's like a family coming for worship. So, like you said, we need to reformat our society, or at least the way we understand church. Does it make sense? Okay, let me run uh, quickly for the um, uh, last part. Oh, yeah, one more comment. A question or is a question because in the church manual recommends that. I don't see any problem doing it on a weekly basis, but usually 
uh, we have a recommendation that should be at least once a quarter. It doesn't say that it can be more than once a quarter, but at least once a quarter we should have. I think that's the principle, am I right? Usually we don't do on a weekly basis, but I don't see any problem if you do a more than once a quarter. I haven't seen many Adventist church, I don't remember any that does on a weekly basis, but I personally don't see any problem. Uh, but we don't, we don't do that. It's not... Just very quickly, I think the background thinking on that one, if you go back to, to the early Adventist church when we put that recommendation together, is that if it's done weekly, it can just become a meaningless ritual. So it's finding that balance between remembering it on an ongoing basis, but not so often it becomes meaningless. Very good. Very good point. So, um, well said. Let's spend 10 minutes. We have 10 more minutes, and I want to challenge you to consider these questions. What can I do to help the pastor and elders to develop a better team? Because you're talking about a team builder, right? Uh, what can I do to help my church become a soul winning church? And what am I doing personally or as a leader, an elder, or as a pastor to help my church discover their gifts, develop their ministries, and become an outlet of God's power? Um, maybe we don't have time for all of them. Let's concentrate on the first two. First two questions. In groups, we have 10 minutes for that. <laughs>